Good morning. <clears throat> Just a few announcements this morning, <clears throat> maybe. Um, so our weekly uh, Bible studies are on this week as, as normal, Tuesday night for men's and ladies study, Wednesday night for Bible study prayer meeting, Friday morning for ladies Bible study as well. As I shared last week, if anybody is interested in being baptized, we'd like to talk about that. Snag myself or one of the elders, and we can we can certainly visit with you about that. Um, there's a time of youth fellowship at four o'clock. So youth, so Tom, youth <laughs> fellowship at four o'clock at the Bible Shack. Um, just a time to get together and enjoy each other's company. I was thinking about this this morning. It's, it's a rhetorical question, but um, did, did you take time this morning to prepare your heart before you entered this place? And don't, don't answer it, don't nod, don't do anything. Just rhetorically. Um, I was seeking to prepare my heart to come, and I just thought, that is needed. It's really needed. Because um, what we do here can become superficial, can become so familiar that we, we can lose the grasp of the holy of what we're doing here together. And so I just want to pray and ask God that he would, he would elevate our expectation and elevate our, our um, I guess, our treatment of that which we're about to do. So let me, let me pray. Father God, the last thing we want to do is take for granted the grace that we've received by the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus. Lord, we are about to come to your table. And Father, if we drink that in an unworthy manner, there are heavy consequences to that. So dear God, I pray that, I don't know what's happened this week in all these lives, or even this morning, What's going on in the hearts and minds of your people as they've set foot in this place? Father, I ask for your Holy Spirit to please God, just open our eyes afresh to your majesty. And I pray, Father, that that would well up deep in our hearts and would come out truly, Lord God, in worship to you. You are the holy, holy, holy God worthy of all exaltation, all glory. Father, may we see you rightly as we open your word, as we sing, as we pray, and Father, as we celebrate your son's death at, at the supper. So my God, I, I pray, would you elevate, would you elevate our love for you, our understanding of your greatness, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Well, good morning. Now, please stand and join with us in singing Here I Am to Worship. <clears throat>
Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <coughs> if you, uh, you know what I'm going to say next? If you have your Bible with you, please turn with me to Genesis 16. Genesis chapter 16 is where we're going to be this morning. <coughs> what if you don't? And if you don't have a Bible, <coughs> shame on you. Um, if you if you need a copy of the Bible, Mark will bring you one. Just raise your hand and turn to Genesis chapter 16. Genesis 16, verse 1. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. She had a female Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said to Abram, Behold now, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my servant. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. So, after Abram had lived ten years in the land of Canaan, Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, the Egyptian, her servant, and gave her to Abram for her, uh, Abram, gave her to Abram, her husband, as a wife. And he went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. And Sarai said to Abram, May the wrong done to me be on you. I gave my servant to your embrace, and when she saw that she had conceived, she looked on me with contempt. May the Lord judge between you and me. But Abram said to Sarai, Behold, your servant is in your power. Do to her as you please. Then Sarai dealt harshly with her, and she fled. Father, I ask for your grace and your mercy in this time in our study, that, God, the truths that are involved in this event in the life of Abram and Sarai, Lord God, are truths we need to hear. We are very much in a boat much like this. And I pray, Father, that you would grant us ears to hear the word of God today. And, uh, Father, a desire, a delight to listen where the Spirit of God may apply this in our own lives personally. And I pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> if there was one phrase that I could say was the phrase I heard most, in my childhood, it would be, no, Danny, be patient. <laughs> if you were to look up impatience in the dictionary, there would be a photo of myself. I am not a naturally patient person at all. I like things to move fast, and I like a lot of stuff to be happening at the same time. God, by his grace, grows our patience. I'm always impressed when I come across a brother or sister in the Lord that is truly patient. Not patient in the sense that they're, they're lazy or in the sense that they're, they're just bored, but in the sense that they really deep-seated trust God. And it comes out in the way they act. They aren't frustrated. They aren't scared. They aren't nervous. They aren't living in anxiety. They truly rest in Him. As I think about this passage that we're looking at this morning, it's interesting, you guys, how quickly we can become judgmental of Sarai and Abram. But let me just remind you, you are a redeemed fallen sinner in the flesh being sanctified in this life. And so the grace that God has shown us, let us be careful as we walk through this text. This is part one. Part two will be next week, so 16, 1 to 6 this morning. Now, the irony of chapter 16 is because of the chapter it follows. If you look at chapter 15, and we, we did this just a few weeks ago, walked through this chapter, the Lord comes to Abram, if you notice verse, uh, I'll pick it up at 2, but Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him 
This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son, the concept there is from your own body, shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, look toward heaven and number the stars if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord and he counted it to him as righteousness. Now, um, drop down to verse 12. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram, and behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. Then the Lord said to Abram, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that's not theirs, and will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for 400 years, but I will bring judgment on the nations that they serve, and afterward they shall come out with the great possessions. As for yourself, you shall go to your fathers in peace, you shall be buried in a good old age, and they shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. And then when the sun goes down, when the sun had gone down, and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire fought and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying to your offspring, I give this land. From the river of Egypt to, and he gives the borders of this land. Chapter 15 was a fresh encouragement, I think was the title. I, I don't remember. Um, but that concept of he came to Abram and said, Abram, Abram, listen to me carefully. Remember, Abram had just gone. He'd taken out all those bad kings. He had rescued Lot. God had given him victory. Um, uh, Melchizedek came and gave a blessing on him, fed them. And then they offered, you know, the king of Sodom offered him great wealth. He says, no, I don't want any of that stuff. I just want the Lord to make me rich, not you. And then after that, he comes to God and says, God, I don't have an offspring. Why not? Give me an offspring. What are you going to give me? And God, by his grace, says, I will fulfill my promise. God makes a covenant with him and says, know this for certainty. Put this in the bank, Abram. You, you can trust my word. And in all of that, beloved, we see Abram believe God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Chapter 15 is, is a beautiful passage, one of the stronger passages that expresses the faith of Abram. I say one of, because eventually we're going to see what happens with Abram and Isaac, and, and that's pretty doggone strong faith. And then chapter 16 shows up, and it's it's sad. There's an irony that 16 follows 15. Because God just said, no for certain. I promise you this. Ten years pass. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. Now, when we hear that, <clears throat> Again, we have to be so careful because there's a familiarity with the Bible. And when we hear about the barrenness of this woman, it's like, well, yeah, but she's going to have kids. And then they'll have kids and they'll have kids. And, you know, we know the end of the story. So it doesn't have as strong of a, of a punch to us. But for this woman, where's God's promise? She has growing impatience. God promised something. I'm going to give this to you. And. They're in Canaan for 10 years. He's not, they're not seeing the promise. There's also a growing humiliation. Remember, very much in this culture, this was a humiliating thing because in the minds of the people there, this was a sign of the judgment of God. She was incapable of having children, which was kind of the, the bragging rights, if you will, that which they would glory in as all the children that they would produce. And now she's barren. And people were saying, well, Sarah, I must have done something. Because she's receiving the judgment of God. Remember Job's great friends? Immediately when they see suffering, they rush to the fact that it's sin. The perceived judgment of God, Sarai's growing humiliation before man, and on top of that, the impatience. And this is where I, I cannot stand too strongly in judgment of this woman because for 10 years, she's been hanging for God's promise, the fulfillment of his promise. God has said he would do this. Now, I don't know about you, but every time I do my best to help God out, it doesn't go well. <laughs> Beloved, I have to say this because I, I want to be very honest with the text. 
I do not fully understand the full motivation in Sarai's heart as she proposes this to Abram. What do you mean, Dan? Well, it might be mixed because please notice that she doesn't say, Abram, you're too old. There's no way this could work for you. She has faith in God's promise to Abram. He's going to have a son. So it's not just that she's like, oh, this is so dumb. Let's just go find two young kids that have kids, and then we'll just adopt those kids and do it that way. And then that will follow God's promise. Forget about God's promise. She doesn't say that. She says, okay, Abram. So, and I'm again, I'm saying this is where my... Uh, the best I can to understand what's happening here, giving her the full benefit of the doubt. Perhaps her thought was, Abram, God promised that you would have a son from your own body, but that doesn't mean I have to be a part of it. It's been, it's been a good 10 years, and we got no kids. So I got an idea. Let's go against God's design. And you bring in another wife. Let's disregard the fact that God has designed it from creation, one man, one woman, husband, and wife. And you can have children with another servant of mine. And that child of the servant, since the servant's my property anyways, I get the kid. And we have helped out God to fulfill his promise. There's something very fascinating about our minds, how we are very, very... Uh, at times, we can be very clever in trying to work around God's will, God's word, to get to the end result that we think God wants us to be in. And so Sarai, childless, humiliated, impatient, struggling, but in faith still believes Abram is going to have children. Look at the text, guys. Just listen to the language. Now, Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. She had a female Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said to Abram, Behold now, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Now, is that true or false? That'd be true <laughs> at this point. The Lord has prevented her from having children at this point. The Lord's prevented me from having children. Go into my servant. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. It's interesting as you read, and I don't, I'm not going to track too much of this here, but as you read this passage and parallel it with the fall in the garden, as, as Eve went, took the fruit, ate of the fruit, brought the fruit to Adam, and Adam asked no questions. The text simply says, she gave some to her husband who was there, and he ate. No questions asked, and they, boom, they both fall. Here, Sarai takes her servant, she brings her servant to Abram, says, Abram, take my servant and do this. And the text, all it says is he listened to the voice of his wife. Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. So impatience, faithlessness, selfish, self-centered, and sinful. Where is there any concept that Hagar is a human being in the text? No, simply she's property, and she'll be our way to get a kid. And that's how we're going to follow in God's promise. That's how we'll do it. No thought given to Hagar in reference to this decision. Abram's total lack of leadership is apparent in the text. There is no question. There is no, perhaps, Sarah, Sarai, God has a plan and we need to be patient and wait on him to fulfill his promise. Now, beloved, let me, let me sidestep here for just a sec, because when we... There are folks who try to make the case that polygamy, having more than one wife, numerous wives, is a biblical concept. And to that we have to say it is a biblical concept in the sense that it is in the Bible, along with a host of other things that are in the Bible. But from the very creation, God's design, a man shall leave his father and mother and cling to his wife. Singular, 
Jesus Christ quotes the exact same text. The Apostle Paul says he should love his wife as Christ loved the church. And it's singular over and over and over and over and over again. That's why people raise their hand and go, yeah, but Abraham did it. Yeah, but Solomon did it. Yeah, watch how it turns out every time. See, this is what's so interesting. There is, there is um, portions of Scripture that are descriptive that, that tell us of, of what happened. That doesn't mean that it's telling us that it's prescriptive or prescribing for how we should be living. And when you see a man take a bunch of wives, I mean, just read the life of Solomon. It was a sad, sad story. How his heart was taken by the gods of his many wives and he's swept off. And so I believe with all of my heart, God's design from the very beginning was one man, one woman in holy matrimony before the Lord. And here Abram listens to his wife and says, yeah, let's just bring in another wife. And that way we can have children. So let's disobey his word in order that we may get closer to the fulfillment of his promise. Adam completely failed and folded to Sarai's plan. Now, I say the irony of chapter 15 and 16. I realize there's a 10-year spot here. So don't, don't miss me there. I'm not saying this happened the next day after the covenant, root, the covenant was made between the Lord and and Abram. But if, if, as just a Bible reader, the irony is striking to me that Moses, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, puts 15 and then 16. And what that does, beloved, hear, hear me please on this one, because it's vital for us to get this. What this proves is that no patriarch was justified by their works. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, Solomon, none of them will stand before the Lord and go, I lived a holy life, and that's why I'm in heaven. They had faith in the coming deliverer, just as you and I had faith in the coming deliverer. He was justified by faith, not by works of the law. And so when we see something like this, we see the act of Abraham here, we can't immediately go, well, what happened to our superhero Abraham? You had the wrong superhero. The superhero is the God of Abraham, not Abraham. He messed up. Just like I do. Just like you do. Impatience is, a, is, is tricky. It gets us to do strange things at times. Abram stepped into a polygamous marriage to help out God. Polygamy is never encouraged in Scripture. It's never commanded in Scripture. It's commanded against, and it's not there at the very beginning of creation. And it's not there in the teaching of Jesus. And it's not there in the teaching of the apostles. It is nowhere to be found. Anytime somebody tries to argue for it, they are completely making a mockery of the storyline of the Bible. The whole event will forever be remembered simply as a major flaw in the life of Abram. He is responsible and has abdicated his responsibility. And I know that when we read passages like this, or we read the passage in Genesis 3, you know, we start to go, so whose fault is it? Is it Sarai's fault? Is it Abram's fault? I, I would argue it's certainly not Hagar's fault. And it's funny to read different commentaries because they, they speak on Sarai and, and what she has proposed here is wrong. But then they put all of the blame on Abram because he was the one who ultimately said, yes, we'll do this. And I, I think that there is just a sin involved here, um, much like what took place with, with Adam and Eve, except for the difference being there's a sinful nature in these two people. And so what's the fallout of this decision? Well, Abram says, yeah, let's go for it. I will take your servant as my wife. She will bear children. Since she's your servant, you get the kids. That's our child. And there's the child according to the promise. Isn't it interesting, guys? You'll, we'll see in a few weeks. When the Lord comes to Abram and tells him to sacrifice Isaac, he says, I want you to take your son, your only son, the one whom you love, Isaac. Why would, why would God be so specific that it's Isaac? 
Because Ishmael is not the child of the promise. Isaac is the child of the promise. Always has been. God has a game plan. And their assistance is not helping him move faster. Hold on, I can't go past that too quick. If God is sovereign, which I believe he is, and he's all-powerful, he's all-knowing, he's in charge of the unfolding of history, then as things come down the line, they are coming down the line at the perfect time. Remember what Jesus said consistently throughout his ministry, my hour has not yet come. Almost as if God has a pre-planned this whole thing. And we need to be so careful, beloved, when we say, God's not moving fast enough. And we grow impatient with him. God knows exactly what he's doing. You do not. Verse 3, so after Abram had lived 10 years in the land of Canaan, Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, the Egyptian, her servant, and gave her to Abram, her husband, as a wife. And he went into Hagar, and she conceived, and when she saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. Now, we're going to see some of the fallout going on here, and this is what's so interesting, is you take Hagar, and thus, thus far in this whole conversation, Hagar has no, no voice. She's just the silent partner of this whole thing. And, and Sarai comes to Abram and says, take my servant. Abram goes, okay, we can do that with your servant, and then we'll have a child. And nowhere in there is any concept of her. She's simply a piece of property. Except when she does something here in this passage. Very, very interesting. Now she is married, quote-unquote, to Abram. They have a child, and Hagar looks at Sarai with contempt. I don't know exactly what that means, that she was holding the baby. Was she giving her the evil eye? Making sure, Sarai, you know this isn't your child. It's mine. We both know whose kid this really is. And it was your husband that you gave to me. And you didn't even ask me. But now I'm the one who has born fruit. I am with child. You aren't. So take that. And it just fried Sarai. It made her so angry. Because this is the servant. She doesn't get to look at me like that. And this is, this is a good test, by the way, as you walk through some of these Old Testament passages that are describing what took place historically. Watch to see how the fallout, what the fallout was from the decision. This fallout results in great despair and actually some great despair that's going to continue on, as we'll see next week. But Abram's wife took Hagar the Egyptian, her servant, and gave her to Abram, her husband, as a wife. And he went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. And Sarai said to Abram, may the wrong done to me be on you. <laughs> the reason I laugh is because do you remember what happened with Adam and Eve after the fall? What was the very next thing? They go and hide, right? They go hide. God's, God's looking around for them. Just like my dad, when my little feet are hanging underneath the couch, hiding. My dad's going, where are you? He knows exactly where I am. And then they say, where were you? Well, we were naked. Who told you you were naked? And then this blaming is the immediate next thing. This, this uh, victim culture that started in the garden where they say, it was the woman you gave me. Think about that, guys. What's he saying? God, you messed up. It's the woman you gave me. The woman says, no, 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 the snake deceived me. It's amazing how fast when we are guilty, if we can play victim, then we don't have to deal with consequences of our actions. And so Sarai says to Abram, you did this. Abram, this is your fault. This one's on you. Now, I think a case might be able to be made for that because you say, well, she did come to him. He was responsible. He could have at that moment said, of course not, Sarai. Don't you remember God's design and walk through that? So 
Yes, I hold him accountable by all means, but come on, she's not guiltless in this thing. But she's angry because she's embarrassed. She's shamed. The culture's laughing at her, and now her own servant is laughing at her because I have a child by your husband, and you don't. So Sarah says to Abram, May the wrong be done to me, may the wrong, the wrong done to me be on you. I gave my servant to your embrace, and when she saw that she had conceived, she looked on me with contempt. May the Lord judge between you and me. Now at that point, again, beloved, again, there's another opportunity for Abram. You know what? Honey, you're right. I was a wimp. I failed. Should have never gone along with this. Should have trusted God's word. I think you were growing impatient. I think that you started to think a little bit crazy and you came up with this scheme. I went right along with it. Went against God's design. And now the servant's laughing at you. You look like a fool. You're angry at me. We're fighting. I should have never done this. But instead, verse 6, but Abram said to Sarai, Behold, your servant is in your power. Do to her as you please, dear. Then Sarai dealt harshly with her, and she fled from her. Sarai schemes. Abram drops his leadership. Hagar is used. Hagar scorns Sarai. Sarai blames Abraham or Abram. Abram folds and tells Sarai to go pour her anger out on Hagar, and Hagar flees. You see this chain and all these weird, messy, sinful links? Because we will not wait for God to accomplish what he said he'd accomplish. I will force his hand. Well, you force his hand, all right, and let's look at how all this is panning out for you. Sin follows sin. You know, it's the classic thing that you, you teach your kids. My parents taught me what comes after a lie. Another lie. And once you got two, you notice the three. And once you've got three, you don't dare tell the truth. Go to four. And go to five. Go to six. Go to seven. Go to eight. Go to nine. The lie, the sin, produces the sin until God in his marvelous grace shatters that wall, crumbles you, and you are in sackcloth and ashes, metaphorically, before him and repenting of that sin. Praise God that that's happened in our life. I am a sinner. I'm convinced of that. We need to be so careful, you guys, because... Let me ask you this. What would be worse, embarrassment or God disregarded in our actions? What do you, you, you hear what I'm saying? It's like at some point, what do you do? Abram, right here, right here, my friend, right here. Stop this whole thing and repent. But instead, he says, no, she's yours, and you can do whatever you want to do with her. And says so she dealt with harshly with her. Um, if I remember correctly, I believe this is the same wording that's used when the Hebrews are enslaved by the Egyptians and they dealt harshly with them. So this wasn't simply that she looked back with a scornful look. She was treating, remember, she's her property. So Sarai needed the permission of Abram to come down on this servant as hard as she liked to do. Abram says, you can do what you want, just keep me out of it. And she starts treating her terribly. Physically, emotionally, I don't know exactly. All I know is that there's terrible treatment of Hagar to the point Hagar runs away. Now, there's a sweet passage where the Lord goes and seeks out Hagar that I, I thought about adding to this message, but I'd rather spend some extra time because these two women are actually used in the book of Galatians in a very interesting way, and I want to save that for, for um, next, next Sunday. Um, so I'm gonna, I want to pause there, but I want to draw your attention to a couple points of application and then come to the Lord's table. Do you know how many times the Bible says the word wait? 
a lot. <laughs> I was surprised how many times as I started looking in my Bible and seeing, wait upon the Lord. Those who wait upon the Lord. Wait, wait, wait. The psalmist especially. But all over the place, this concept of patiently waiting on God to accomplish his purpose is all over your Bible. The Bible has a lot to say about waiting on God. What is at the heart of Christian patience? This is, this is where I'm, I'm coming from this passage, and I'm seeing the impatience and the, the, what they did here, and I want to apply that and ask a couple questions of our own lives. What is at the root? What's the very base of Christian patience? Because remember, this is the fruit of the Spirit, if you remember. Love, joy, peace, patience. I am convinced, and, and I'm sure you may have other bits and pieces you would add to this, and pile it on, beloved, but here's a few things that came to my mind. At the very root of patience is a true understanding of who God is. The greater we understand him, the more patient we become. After all, if he is omniscient, and if he is all-powerful, and he's mighty, if he has a great and glorious plan that he will bring to fruition... See, this is why it's so interesting when Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount says, don't be anxious. And you go, oh man, don't be anxious. I'm anxious all the time. Jesus is saying, well, you're not really looking at reality if you're being anxious. Because reality, in reality, God has everything under control and is sovereignly working all things together for good for those who love him and call according to his purpose. Don't be anxious. And it's a wrestle with my flesh and the word of God. When I find myself in anxiety, my heart beats a little faster. I'm nervous. I can't sleep. I got worries. I got people on my mind and heart. I've got trauma in this county, and I'm struggling. And I hear God's word not asking me to try and consider not being anxious. It commands do not be anxious. At the base of that is trust in God's word, trust in His wisdom and in His power. Number two, Believing his word in the midst of the anxiety, calling his word back to mind, I think, is what also grants us great patience. But also this, I've been thinking about this a lot. I am convinced God does some of his best fine-tuning in the waiting and not in the actual event when something happens. When he's got you on pins and needles and you're going, what's he going to do? What's going to happen? Am I going to get the job? Not get the, uh, get the job. Am I going to get fired? Am I going to get laid off? Uh, what's happening? I haven't heard back from them in two days. What's In that moment is when God is doing some beautiful work in us. And I'm not talking down to anybody. I'm the, probably the most impatient person in this room, including my sons. They're more patient than I am. But God does some beautiful work in the waiting. And so there's a vast difference between, God, what are you doing? And, God, what are you doing? The difference being one is outraged and the other one is actually asking, Lord, what are you accomplishing in my anxious moment? What are you developing in Dan during this time? The time of waiting is soul surgery. God is doing surgery of the soul in those moments of anxiety that is then swallowed up by truth. That is God doing great surgery in our soul as he matures us in him. Second point of application is this. God cares just as much in the path as he does in the destination. At times, beloved, it's not necessarily where we're going, but what we're doing on our way to where we're going that God wants, is interested in and in what he's producing in us. God cared very much about Abraham and Sarai in those ten years and in their patience and in their following of his word and of his promise. They wanted to help him out. They disobeyed his word to try to get near, nearer to the fulfillment of his word. Guys, God cares much about who you are in the doing what you're doing. And I'll, I'll give myself as an example, okay? So in this pulpit this morning, I'm opening the word of God. I'm preaching before you as, as one of your shepherds with a heart that's full of, of desire to open the word and preach before you. I can do this. 
with a heart disengaged from the Lord. I don't want to. I, I don't, that's not where I'm at this morning. I'm ecstatic to bring this word before you. But God cares about what's happening in the individual, in the doing, not just the doing. What's actually in the heart of the person, the desire in the person. Because at the end, they could say, God, look, there's a child from Abraham's body, just like you said, his name's Ishmael, right? The Lord says, no, no, that's not him. That's not the one I promised. He's not the child I promised. Of course not. I will bring that son to you. You haven't helped me out in the least. We cannot ignore God's commanded path and think we will be granted his destination. Do we truly trust the Lord to accomplish his word, or don't we? And finally, obedience to what we know to be true from God's word is not up for debate. No shortcuts. He will strengthen you for the journey of faithfulness. And that's what the word I leave you with this morning, no shortcuts. As much as the flesh is just eating at you at times, trying to pull you towards something, beloved, no shortcuts. My mentor always likes to use the term the high road. You got a couple roads to choose between, look for the high one, and walk in obedience to God's word. Beloved, we have every reason to trust in him, following and obeying and bringing his word to absolute completion. And the best argument I could give for that was that moment of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ was exactly what the Father predetermined before eternity, or in all eternity. And when Jesus cried, it is finished, you think about the eternal timeline moving towards that exact instant that his last breath left his body was predetermined by the Trinity. I have every reason to think that my God will help me find my keys. And will help me with my anxiety and saying, God, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? What am I going to do? We've forgotten who he is in the midst of our anxiety. Beloved. And so I challenge you with the last thought, probably already said that. The greatest thing we can do is stop focusing on ourselves. Focus on him. The greater our focus is upon him, that's where health resides. Not trying to figure ourselves out, but know our God. The best thing that ever happened to Isaiah was when he rightly saw the Lord. Because then Isaiah knew Isaiah. And that's when we know ourselves. That's when things come into focus. When we see our God rightly, Abraham and Sarai stop seeing him rightly for a moment. So let me, let me pray and ask God to uh, just be with us as we come to the table. And Andrew, John, if you guys would help me serve this morning. Let me pray. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we are a fallen people that are in absolute need for a redeemer. And I thank you, dear Lord, that I know whom I have believed and am persuaded he's able to protect, to guard, to rescue my soul. And Father, I have confidence in the assurance of my salvation, but Lord, at the same time, I want my life to be holy before you. I want to walk in holiness before you, Lord. not go after shortcuts but perhaps suffer a bit on the high road for the name of Jesus that looks different for all of us and all the different pieces of our lives but Lord God my, my deep earnest prayer is that we would be honest with ourselves before you and I ask you God to search our minds search our hearts today and God, as we turn our attention to 
your supper, and we hold the bread and this cup, contemplating God in the flesh being crucified, absorbing the wrath of the Father in my stead. Lord, I'm amazed. I stand amazed that I'm a saved man this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> On the night that the Lord Jesus was betrayed, there with his disciples, remember they had the Passover meal, and the Lord, the Lord took bread and he broke it. He said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you do. Here's that to it. Father, may we never take for granted the truth of your word. May we truly be humble in this time to know that with the gospel we ultimately get you. Father, I thank you for this message today, for this body, for who you are, your sacrifice, the gift of salvation only through your Son. It's in his name we pray. Amen.
after that, the Lord Jesus took the cup. And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Drink this as often as you do it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until his return. Let's stand and sing our last song, and then John will be close to us. when the roll is called up yonder and it'll get you skipping the beat for the rest of the day and you'll be humming this the rest of the week it's wonderful stand before the presence of you, washed by the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Amen.